Okay. okay, great. So here we go. Just for those of you that have not ever used um, a Blackboard Collaborate, just want to point out some features. Um, we just used the polling. You're welcome to um, add some emoticons. Um, we also have some whiteboard tools. And most importantly, you will be using the um, chat box if you have questions, comments, or concerns as we go along. And then when we get to the question and answer <coughs> session, you know, feel free if you have audio capability to raise your hand and we'll turn the mic over so that um, Dr. Kolb can address your question. Or if you're more comfortable, then please go ahead and put your question um, into the chat box. I have received several questions via email that I will try to get out there when we get to the Q&A part. Um, but for now, I'm going to go ahead and um, let you know that we are operating a, a back channel. Um, it's the um, Twitter hashtag from my mobile learning class. So um, if you'd like to follow the conversation there or continue to follow that hashtag, you'll find lots of great tools and resources that my um, that myself and my students have been sharing uh, across this semester. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Liz Kolb. Um, she is the author of uh, Toys. Uh, to Tools, Connecting Students' Cell Phones to Education, as well as Cell Phones in the Classroom, A Practical Guide for Educators, and that happens to be the text for one of my graduate cor courses here at North Carolina State University. She is also um, the author of numerous articles for ISTE's Learning and Leading with Technology. She has a PhD in Learning Technologies from the University of Michigan, as well as a Master's Degree in Curriculum Instruction from Ashland University. She is currently a clinical assistant professor at the University of Michigan, and um, as well as a, um, as well as at where she helps um, in-service and pre-service teachers um, working with 21st century technology education. She has done workshops, webinars, and in-services throughout the United States. She also spent seven years as a secondary teacher in Ohio. She taught social studies and computer technology courses. In addition, she spent four years as a high school, uh, high school technology coordinator in Columbus, Ohio. She now lives um, with her lovely husband and beautiful two children in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And so without further ado, here is Dr. Liz Culp. Well, thank you, Lisa, for that great introduction. And um, I can try to put myself on video. Um, first, I will say in that previous slide there, that little one-year-old boy that you see um, is sitting right next to me right now. Um, my husband should be home any minute, but just in case you hear a little crying and screaming in the background, um, you will know uh, what is going on with that. So I'll see if my video is working. There we go. All right, excellent. So as Lisa mentioned, I am um, a former um, high school technology coordinator, <laughs> social studies teacher. So when I came to get my PhD in education technologies, I really came with a very practical approach to technology in the classroom. And I also came with um, a lot of concerns about using student phone devices in the classroom. I wrote the policies against having cell phones. So I wasn't really pro using cell phones when I started on my um, doctorate. But a few things changed along the way. So I want to kind of talk about my journey very briefly and then some of the different things that we're starting to see um, in the classroom. So one of the interesting things that happened to me was um, while I was getting my PhD and, and since then, every year I teach courses for new and beginning teachers. And I always ask them the same question, which is what technology would you like to have in your future classroom? And um, uh, you know, let me just ask you in the chat room, you can type your answer, but what do you think the top answer is? Um, for these new teachers, new and beginning teachers, ages, you know, anywhere from 20 to 56. Um, what is their top answer for the technology that they would like to have in their classroom? So see if you can take a guess. Interactive whiteboards, smart boards, laptops, iPads, rely on internet, smart boards. I see a lot of smart boards, a lot of iPads, uh, laptops, wireless um, technology, video cams. So you might be kind of surprised um, that their answer happens to be, you can see their number one answer here. Their number one answer every year is always the same for the last eight years. 
And that is, as you can see, the um, chalkboard dry erase board. And um, if you also might notice that a lot of <laughs> see the wows, a lot of um, the technologies that you might see along that list, uh, in general, they tend to be um, uh, they tend to be technologies that are pretty. Um, uh, a basic in our classroom that have been around for decades and many, many years. Uh, you know, some have been around for hundreds of years, you know, a chalkboard. Um, uh, there's nothing really new um, about these technologies. They're not talking about using iPads. They're not talking about iPods. They're not talking about um, video games. None of that. Um, these are very familiar technologies to them. Which I always found very interesting. I also asked them, do you want to use the technology, um, do you want to be the sage on the stage and have all the technology with you, or do you want to um, have the students have the technology, like a one-to-one -one program? Overwhelmingly, they all give me the same answer for the most part. 80% of them say, no, I want to be the sage on the stage. I want the technology. I have no idea what to do with every student that has an iPod or every student that has an iPad. I'm really uncomfortable with that. And in reality, I don't think this data should surprise us, and this happens every year, because we know a lot of people go into teaching because they um, teach the way that they were taught. So they think about their favorite second grade teacher or their favorite high school teacher, and they want to be just like them. So they want to have those same technologies. They don't think about the future and thinking about preparing you know, students for the 21st century. They don't think about the fact that when they graduate high school, 65% of jobs won't have even been invented yet at this point. Um, they really think backwards rather than forward. Um, so, so they have these beliefs about teaching that are finely ingrained in them. So when I was getting my PhD, I read this um, very interesting quote, um, I read this book called Mindstorms by Seymour Papert, who's kind of this big programmer guy. And the book itself to me wasn't that exciting, but there was this one quote in there that kind of jostled my mind. And this was back in 2004. And it said, some of the most crucial steps in mental growth are based not simply on acquiring new skills, but on acquiring new administrative ways to use what one already knows. And I started to think about, well, what do our students already know? And this was back in 2004. And I looked around campus and I saw that, well, what they know is kind of their mobile devices, in particular their cell phones at that time. Um, but this is what I see every day on campus. Yet I know when they walk in their classrooms, they're told no. They can't use them. Um, and this is not just at the university level, but it was at K-12. Now at this point, I had no idea what to do with cell phones. Again, I was kind of an advocate against in 2004. But that really changed. So I kind of kept in mind that students liked their cell phones, but I didn't know what to do with them until I had this experience when I was teaching. Um, as Lisa mentioned, I kind of moonlighted at Madonna University, and I taught in-service teachers um, while I was getting my PhD. And in 2005, I was working with some teachers from Detroit, because most of the teachers at Madonna are, are teachers in Detroit. And I was showing them how to do all sorts of things, interactive whiteboards and clickers. And what they would say to me every time was, Liz, and right and say, Liz, we can't do this. We can't afford to do this in Detroit. Our students don't have access to it. We don't have clickers. We don't have computers in our classroom. We don't have X, Y, and Z. Almost every lesson. And then I was showing a couple of teachers how to web blog. And while I was showing them in 2005 how to web blog, this message popped up on my screen, and it said, audio blog from your cell phone. And this is kind of the message that I got. And I had no idea what it meant, but I was curious, so I dialed this number they gave me, this 415 number, and I, they said, you know, record your audio blog, whatever that is. So I went ahead and recorded it, and I, I hung up the phone, and all of a sudden on my blog or blog, this little MP3 file popped up of what I had said. And I went, wow, that was kind of the easiest podcast I'd ever made, because back then, um, your podcasts were really cumbersome. And one of the teachers from Detroit turned to me and said, well, my students can do that because they all have a cell phone. That's what they do all day. They talk on their cell phone. They, they're starting to text. And then we started talking about, well, what, what learning activities could we do with this? And we came up with all sorts of ideas, oral history and working with ESL students and recording debates and recording speeches and practicing on literacy and language. And 
So I raced home so curious and I scoured the internet looking for teachers who are using cell phones. And back in 2005, you can probably guess how many teachers I found using cell phones in the classroom. That would be zero. So what happened was I um, decided to talk with the teachers from Detroit and we started coming up with our own lesson plans. And some of the teachers decided to try some of the activities in their classroom um, because they could do it. It's the thing they had access to. And so this is one example of a teacher. This is um, uh, Pat Sattler, who uh, teaches at a K-8 um, school um, near Detroit. And she had always wanted to do, <laughs> you recognize the pink razor, she had always wanted to do um, radio theater podcasts. And they didn't have microphones on their computers in their school, and it was really cumbersome in, in 2005 to do that. So when she learned about um, the feature of being able to just call and record to the internet, um, she found a resource called HipCast. And so she used that and just her one pink um, Motorola Razor phone to record radio theater podcasts um, for her third, fourth, and fifth graders. Um, and she told me that it was one of the easiest and most productive ways that she's been able to use technology because the kids were very familiar with the phone. It was easy to call in and record. And um, she since has done many, many different activities with the cell phones. So that's kind of one example back in 2005. Now, as we were lesson planning and we were putting different things together, um, I decided to send an article to ISTE's um, Learning and Leading with Technology just to tell them about what we were doing. And they ended up featuring the article, it's this one here, the, the Toy to Tool article. And um, the editor called me and said, do you have anything else? This is really exciting. We've never seen this. And I said, yeah, actually, I have kind of dozens of lesson plans and resources we're using and different management strategies. And um, they said, great, send it to us. And I ended up putting it in the first book that um, Lisa mentioned, this Toys to Tools, full of lesson plans and ideas of how to use you know, student cell phones with free resources. I always focus on free because I was a tech coordinator. I know how expensive things are. And then I started hearing from teachers who picked up my book and started trying these activities. They were tweeting me, um, sending me emails. And so I decided to call and interview a lot of them to find out what they're doing and what's working and what's not working and what resources they're using and how they're manipulating it for their curriculum. And that's how um, this second book came about, the Cell Phones in the Classroom book, which is a bunch of case studies of what teachers are now doing. And let me show you a few examples from the second book of what teachers are doing. So this is Allison McCarty. And Allison um, was a student teacher at the time. And she was in a private high school teaching Spanish. She's a foreign language teacher. And what happened with her was she found that her students were not really participating in the classroom. Um, you know, she would have the same three or four students in each class who would participate. But many of them were very shy about speaking Spanish or writing Spanish in front of their peers. So what she did was she decided to have her students use their cell phones and share cell phones and text in their answers to um, a free texting board online. So they ended up using a resource called Wafiti. There's a lot of resources out there that allow you to kind of text in. This is just one of the many free resources out there. And what um, she did was, if you, you can kind of see, but she would give them a sentence in Spanish, and um, then she would ask them to text up, um, or sorry, a sentence in English, and ask them to translate it into Spanish. And then they would go through the different answers and say, you know, this one's correct, or this one's incorrect, and why. And you might notice that all the answers are anonymous. So what's really nice is that the students didn't have to worry about being wrong and being called out on the spot, but they would still get feedback from what they were doing in the classroom. She also uses this board for um, Spanish text speak. So if um, any of you are for foreign language teachers, you might be um, familiar with the fact that foreign languages also have their own text speak and text chat happening. So she would ask them um, to take kind of a sentence in English or a phrase and put it into Spanish text speak. And then when they would go to Spain, they would be able to use text messaging to communicate as well. 
Um, so here's another example. Um, this is Jimbo Lamb, and he's a high school math teacher in Pennsylvania, and he had contacted me to tell me about what he was doing. And with many math teachers, one of his struggles is the students would say, you know, Mr. Lamb, why am I doing this? Why are we learning these numbers? And, you know, A plus B equals C. It's not relevant to my life. And so, um, what he did was he found a resource called Yodio.com, another free resource out there. And Yodio um, allowed his students to call in to a toll-free number. So even though 95% of the students had a cell phone, um, the 5% that didn't have could also use a landline or a friend's phone. And what he said, here's the Yodio, what he said was, when you are out and about in your real life, in your everyday life, and you are doing quadratics, because that happened to be their unit at the time, I want you to stop in that moment, recognize that you are doing quadratics, and I want you to call in and say what you're doing, how it relates to, to quadratics, and also um, put it into some, the quadratic equation, and um, can take pictures of it and send it to Yodio. And so what he ended up having was a whole kind of digital storybook of, of captured experiences of everyday life um, where they're using mathematics and, and algebra in their everyday life. So this is Judy Peterson. And Judy had a really um, kind of unique situation. Her situation was that she's teaching um, high school English in California, and if you notice on these statistics down here at the bottom, you'll see that a large percent of her student population um, is Hispanic, and um, they are first um, generation. So many of them, their native, you know, their native language is Spanish, and they really struggle with English. They're English language learners. So um, she really struggled with getting them to start writing in English, and so. What she ended up doing was um, she found that many of them like to tweet and text. So she kind of combined that love for tweeting and texting, and she started texting out and tweeting out um, the homework and asking them to text or tweet her back. And often she would ask for multiple texts and tweets. So in the end, they ended up writing more than if they had written on a piece of paper. But because it was familiar technology to them, they seemed to have a much bigger comfort with that um, than um, through the uh, kind of traditional form. So she was able to work on their languages. And they've actually done a lot of different things through the cell phone because she found that that is um, kind of a favorite way for them to communicate. So she's trying to meet them where um, it's culturally relevant for them. So this last one I want to share with you right now is um, Kip Rogers. And Kip um, was a middle school principal in Virginia. And as you can see, um, the majority of its population um, is African American. Um, and I would say um, the majority of its population is also on free and reduced lunch. So he has a lower income population. And his frustration was that a lot of students didn't have access to technology at home. So one day he was giving his students, we're taking a standardized test for the state, as we do now. And um, uh, they didn't have enough calculators for the math portion of the standardized test. So Mr. Rogers kind of called out to the students, they were seventh graders, and said, um, who has a calculator? Does anyone have a calculator we can use? And one of the students raised his hand and said, oh, Mr. Rogers, I have um, a calculator on my cell phone. It's in my locker. And uh, Kip was really surprised, a seventh grader having a cell phone, low income area, and he said, how many of the rest of you also have um, a cell phone. And he said, you know, about 70% of his students raised their hand. And he was shocked. And then he sent home a survey and found out that almost all the parents had a cell phone. So he really switched his communication from kind of email and papers home into text messaging for that year. And then he decided to um, give his whole school a summer professional development around how they can use cell phones in the classroom. Um, and they ended up coming up with the first, what I've seen, um, cell phone policy to be inclusive. This was back in about 2008. So it was a very early policy um, when they started to include cell phones. And they did a lot of professional development for the teachers, showing them how to use their cell phones and the students. So they did you know, everything from poll everywhere to um, texting and picture activities with Flickr. Um, they even ended up writing a book of lesson plans. So um, very inspiring. That whole school really got on board with it. Um, and many parents were able to get more involved with their children's um, 
learning that way. And I see somebody's kind of mentioning it's really extending um, to other technologies, and I feel like it really extends the learning. So just a few other things, because I know there um, should be a question and the answer portion, but um, a couple of resources that are some of my favorites out there right now, so I want to share some of those with you. Um, uh, the, one of my favorite things to do right now, especially in my own teaching, is kind of the text message alerts, because they're so easy, and they're so versatile. There's so many different things you can do, from projects to basic communication. My absolute favorite one right now is Sally, but there's quite a few out there. Um, and what I love about Sally is you can set up a text alert for your entire students or parents or groups of students, and it can be private or public, and you can set it up so students can text you back or text back the whole group so you can have conversations and students can pretend to be historical figures and that type of thing. Um, so it's just a fantastic free resource to take advantage of. And um, you can text out for homework. I know um, Judy Peterson uses it now with her ESL students that I mentioned before. I think this is a great example of using the text alerts very effectively. Um, school in Connecticut, a K-8 school, um, that you know, loss of learning issue that we have over the summer, what they've done is they've created a text of the week option. And parents, depending on the grade level, or students can opt in to the text of the week for their grade level. And each day they get a different text um, uh, based around um, curriculum. So Monday, Vocabulary Day, Wednesday, Mathematics, and there's usually an activity to do. It's pretty short and simple, but they connect the curriculum from the previous year to the new year. And then the other great thing is that um, the teacher for the new year actually gets a hold of all the data. So for example, if they're texting in pictures of places they've gone or different habitats, or um, they're sending in definitions of different words or ideas for science experiments, all of that data can be used the next year so the teacher can actually use authentic data um, and pull from different kids' experiences rather than having to kind of go to Google and just make something up because um, they don't have as much time to grab things. So, and, and Sally, I think, is the perfect resource for something like that. Um, another thing that has just been an easy thing to do and just really fun because, you know, I'm somebody who taught in the 90s. I started in the 90s, I should say. And it was so hard to contact authors and experts. You really had to dig to do that. And now, of course, we have everybody on Twitter. You can follow anyone you want. You don't even have to be on Twitter. You can just text in to follow whatever their um, Twitter tag is. Um, to 40400, and you can follow them. So you can have students following authors and um, scientists and, you know, with the election, different politicians and what they're saying and weighing the different sides. Um, it can be a really kind of neat research project that you do and pretty simple. Um, another really simple thing with text messaging is um, having students summarize information um, because that's often a frustration. <laughs> My husband there. <laughs> that's often a frustration with, um, many English teachers uh, and social studies teachers is that students have a hard time reading different um, uh, romantic languages and um, classic English. So um, this ninth grade teacher, what she ended up doing was having the students, instead of just kind of rewriting each word of uh, the Shakespeare act that they read to summarize it, having them you know, summarize by using 140 characters or less um, and just texting in uh, those those particular answers. Again, you can use Selly for this, you can use Wafidi, you can use Poll Everywhere, just tons of great free resources that you can use um, to get the students sending in uh, answers and such. So this is kind of a neat um, project as well, uh, the Murmur Oral History Project. Um, there's a, definitely a belief, if anyone's a social studies um, teacher, you probably have heard this, but the idea that um, the best way to get an oral history interview is to kind of go back to the location where it happened, rather than just talking in a dark room. So there's this project called the Murmur Project, and it's in Canada, but all these little red dots that you see here on the map are all places where people have recorded an oral history about that location. And um, I think this concept is just a really neat idea to do. And there's so many different resources online that you can use to record. I mentioned HipCast before, um, that the one teacher with the Motorola Razor used. Um, there's also, I'm going to go that, yeah. There's also um, resources such as uh, iPodio.com. Uh, I should type that into the chat room. <laughs> iPodio.com. And of course, you can use something like Google Voice. 
Um, so there's quite a few resources online to record um, and just to set your phone down and, and capture that information. Um, so I think that's a really good example of, of being able to use um, cell phones to extend in the moment. So let me show you one um, more thing. And of course, um, now that we have so many more smartphones, we're also dealing now with more with um, QR codes a lot more, these quick response codes in the classroom. So I wanted to show you a very short video of how one school is using the QR codes in the classroom. And I think it's um, just really kind of exciting. Um, so Lisa, I don't know if you can post in this link because I forgot to put my PowerPoint up right now. Um, so, uh, you know, even if you don't have a QR code reader on your phone, there's actually a resource where you can send in a picture of the QR code and they'll text you back with the information on the code itself. Um, so uh, Lisa posted in the link and I think I will just give you a couple minutes to go ahead and watch um, the video and when you're done just click on the green check. If you have any comments just go ahead and type those in. All right, I'm going to jump back in. It looks like many of you have finished watching the video. A few of you had trouble with the link, and I'm sorry about that. Um, and some of you had said you've seen the video before. And you know what I think is really exciting about this video is it really shows you a lot of possibilities of QR codes in many different curricular areas. And one of the big, um, uh, you know, kind of goals of, of the showing the video is is that um, it's really about extending learning and you know giving empowering the student in the learning process a lot. Um, so I have a lot of resources on my website, um, uh, different ways to generate QR codes and all sorts of creative ways. One of my current favorites I wanted to share with you right now, which is Poll to Go, and it's just a fantastic resource. Um, Sorry, right, just a second in the basement. Go get Danny down. The baby. Sorry, my daughter is asking me a question. Um, but but one of the um, uh, one of the the great resources is Pull to Go, and I use this a lot in my classes because you can create these really great um, easy QR code polls um, that are. <laughs> that are surveys and so um, if you log in you can see you can create multiple choice polls or you know open ended polls and um, turn them into QR code polls or you know short links that people have access to the internet. 
and I use them a lot with my own classes and teaching, and I have my students use them a lot as well. Um, so I highly recommend this resource. I think it's fantastic. Um, and it's one of the many resources where you can create the QR code um, uh, in unique ways. There's other ones where you can attach your voice to it. You can um, actually set it up so that it creates um, kind of a timeline when you're reading a book. Um, UV Mark is, is that one. So lots of creative ones. So definitely check out my website under resources for lots of ideas. And then finally, um, this is just one example of I think a good extending learning with the QR codes where the teacher created different activities for second graders and the parent chaperones used their phones, took a picture of the code, and then had the students do that different activities sometimes recording their voice or sending in pictures and, of course, collecting a lot of data from that particular experience. So those are kind of just a few of the resources um, that I wanted to share and a little bit about how I kind of got to this point. Um, there's a lot of exciting things going on now with cell phones and bring your own technology and I think that's just awesome. I think we've moved from, you know, people telling me I was insane and crazy um, to now people wanting to try it and, and really looking for ways to do it. So I, I think that's um, really exciting. So I will kind of take myself off the mic um, and uh, let Lisa kind of uh, moderate and navigate the questions. Thank you so much for that just awesome presentation, um, Liz. Um, that was incredibly enjoy enjoyable and we definitely learned a lot. Um, I'm going to invite everybody to um, either raise your hand. I can already see that people are typing into the chat box, but to give people a little bit of time to think about a question that they would like um, Liz to answer. I'm going to go ahead and just pull from one of the ones that I got um, from the email um, uh, that many people replied to on asking some advanced questions. And um, the question is really about, um, you know, there is a lot of information, and you may or may not know the answer to this, um, Liz, but you know, there's a lot of buzz around, you know, iPads and, you know, all of those new devices coming. But what we know is um, that, you know, the Android-based tablets, you know, you know, are, tend to be a little bit cheaper. And so the question was, is, you know, do you know anything about how um, Android-based tablets can be an alternative to iPads for school um, systems that are on a tight budget? So that was really the question. That, you know, well, there's some cheaper alternatives out there um, for schools to be using um, in terms of mobile devices. So I kind of have a, a, a lump answer for that, I guess, which is um, my concern when school districts, um, in my old school district we were guilty of this as well, um, when we purchase equipment technology for kind of a one-to-one -one approach, we have to have a way to sustain that. And unless schools actually write it into kind of their 10-year budget plan, which most of them don't, they kind of get a grant, they purchase it, and then over time things break down and they run out and they can't sustain it. So we kind of lose. Um, that ability to do the one-to-one. -one. So I'm actually not a big advocate for schools purchasing equipment in general. Um, uh, I prefer that schools really focus on what students actually have, whether it's a cell phone, a Nintendo DS game player, uh, um, you know, Kindle at home, whatever it might be, a Leap Pad, um, because those are things that we can sustain because students um, will always have access to some kind of technology and even in low income areas we know that students have a lot of access to technology at home. It's not traditional technologies and that's where we need to do some training with our teachers and work with them. But my concern, <coughs> excuse me, my concern with um, you know, the Android, um, you know, tablets or the um, iPads or whatever it might be is that it's hard to s sustain um, long term. Um, and if schools can do it, um, then, you know, you definitely should look at all your options. Um, you know, the, 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 um, for me, the bonus of the iPad is that I think right now the apps um, for Apple education-wise are a little bit stronger than the app, the general apps for the Android. I know there's some that cross over, um, but I found that the ones um, that I've seen for Apple are just a little bit stronger education-wise. Um, but you have to be able to sustain it, so that's the big key. Okay, I, I think that's some really great advice moving forward, and um, a lot of the people in the in the 
in this sure. webinar, you know, really echoed your sentiments uh, around device purchase, et cetera, and then especially in terms of sustainability. You know, sustainability is a very key issue, you know, and as we move forward with tighter and tighter budgets, we certainly need to think about how we think more about content and learning and not so much about the device. But um, that's for another day. Um, there were a couple other questions that, um, that came through. Um, someone asked about um, what were your, if you have any of um, favorite apps, mobile apps for social studies. Well, one of mine that's kind of at the top of my head because the election just occurred and I was a social studies teacher, um, is the mobile vote app. Um, I really like that um, uh, simply because it allows you students to figure out and, you know, you type in your um, zip code and then it tells you who your state senators are and your state um, uh, congressional representatives. It shows you how they're voting on issues. It shows you all the different um, kind of uh, perspectives on the issues. It allows you to actually kind of type them or excuse me, um, write them an email or even a text message for some and communicate with them in different ways. And it kind of shows you can vote along with them and see how close you are in agreement to different ways that they're voting. Um, so I'm a huge fan of that in particular um, that I've uh, used with the students lately. So that, that's probably um, one of my big favorites. Another one kind of in general um, that I've used is um, uh, I can't remember the name, but the digital storyteller app, um, and of course I'll think of it in a minute, um, but just for putting together some kind of simple digital storybooks um, we've been using as well, which um, I think I'll think of it in a minute. I'm sure it's in my bookmarks. I have too many apps in my head. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Um, mobile voting app is getting, getting some traction out here. Um, so some other things just, um, you know, in closing and just making sure that, um, you know, we've all been working a long day and, you know, obviously a lot of people have just come from teaching and we'll probably want to delve more into all of the great resources um, that you've talked about or provided in this presentation. Is there like a, I mean, I know there's your blog. Is there another website that you could share with us in the chat room um, that might have the listing of the things that you have mentioned um, during the webinar? What would be the best uh, resource to point them to if you could put that into the, the chat box, that would be great. Um, I would definitely go um, to my blog um, because in my blog I have a tab called um, resources and I'll um, put that here in the chat room in just a minute, the exact um, link to it. But um, that under the resources I have, um, hang on a second, under the resources I have all the different things I've talked about. Um, as well as um, all the resources that are kind of working right now. I try to update that continuously. So that second link that um, just occurred in there has the link to my resources page. Um, so that's probably the most up-to-date. Um, a place I like to go often to find out about new resources for mobile devices, um, I often go to a place called Listio. Um, and I look under the mobile search and I kind of subscribe to their feed there so that I can um, get the updates to the latest um, new uh, mobile apps and uh, mobile websites that are out there um, to use that, that connects with um, phones and other mobile devices. So that's kind of the place I go to find out about the newest and, and latest things. Um, and on my website, I also do talk about some places that are starting to kind of rate like educational apps on, on, um, for, for phones and other mobile devices. Those are newer sites and, and they're, they're up and, and running and um, those are some good places to, to go. Okay, great. Those are some great resources that I'm sure everybody will be um, adding to their RSS feeds, hopefully. Um, do you have a great um, question from um, Caroline. Um, and you may or may not know the answer, but um, she was just wondering in terms of, you know, we are, there is some transition going on in terms of cell phone use um, across um, a 3G versus a 4G um, network. And so the question is, is what do you predominantly find um, teachers out there using and are there great fee differences um, depending on what ne network they're ac accessing? So it's really, um, 
hodgepodge. Um, I would say the majority are still focused on 3G, but um, for the most part, uh, I would say that um, the teachers are really the teachers who are doing the kind of bring your own device are. Um, the ones who are doing it well, I should say, have um, found out what students are charged for in their plans, and that's kind of key. And I talk about that a lot in my books, that you have to survey the students and find out what they have and what their um, phone plans say, um, because you don't want them to be um, charged for work that they're doing in the classroom. And sometimes the students don't really know what they're charged for and what they're not charged for. Jimbo Lamb, who I talked about earlier, um, the math teacher, actually at the beginning of the school year has the students bring in a copy of um, their cell phone bill so that um, they can actually uh, go through and figure out what am I charged for, what, is, what do I have to pay extra for, because even though, as we know, sometimes you can do it on your phone, you can you know, download pictures or watch video, it doesn't necessarily mean it's free with your plan or it's part of your plan. So he does a lot of work with talking with them about that. So once you know what the students can and can't do, um, then the 3G versus 4G um, isn't as big of a deal because you're really looking through their particular plans itself. Um, so definitely with the bring your own technology, I recommend um, that. The other issue we have in schools um, is that a lot of schools are kind of older. Um, including the building I teach in, and there are some classrooms where um, mobile devices just don't connect as well to the Wi-Fi or um, whatever you might be using, and so that's just an issue that we're dealing with too. We're starting to have schools actually asking to build a new building because they want to be able to have better connections in the classroom. Um, so that's another, um, I think, concern that, was coming up, that we're coming up against is the fact that we just have older buildings and they're just not wired. Um, for um, any kind of satellite or any other kind of connection easily. Um, yeah, we get, a, we get a lot of that um, in a lot of the more rural schools um, in our state. And, um, and one of my students, Pam, was talking about they have a cell phone dead zone inside their building. Um, Do you have any experience, you know, um, with um, perhaps you know using arrays, or do you know anything about that? We have a, a school um, out in the eastern part of our, our state that, or I guess western part of our state that um, has a, put a lot of arrays. I mean, they they have that, that that classic you know 1950s building, and they decided to go up on the roof versus trying to rewire. Did you have any thoughts you want to share about that as we work with schools and districts and? educators about how we problem solve these issues. Another idea that I know that they did was, as a, as a community, and they really did a lot of outreach um, when they decided long before they actually um, put devices into the, the hands of their students. But they also worked with their local communities and business and found out where all the free Wi-Fi spots were in their city and provided that map um, to both their students and their parents. Um, but I, I guess my, my larger question is, is, do you have any ideas about how to work around those issues? Have you seen any really innovative um, approaches? So oh, unfortunately, I don't think I have a really good answer. I've seen very expensive approaches, unfortunately. Um, like I said, I've seen actually schools um, trying to get uh, money to build um, new buildings or building new wings onto their school that kind of become the, the tech wing so that they can do a lot of the high-end things in that particular wing that's more um, friendly to satellite and other connections. But at this moment, I don't really have any great advice for that. I haven't seen any good inexpensive examples of how they've been able to work around it other than um, physically you know, moving the kids to different places in the, the school itself, which isn't a great solution, I know. Okay, well, they, you know, and again, I think each individual school and district are just trying to come up with their own creative ways of getting around that. Um, I think we'll kind of end, I'm going to kind of borrow a little bit of a page from Ashley's comment and just ask you in general, um, because she was saying, what she's saying is that one of the advantages of the cell phone is that it helps get around some of those filters um, that, that, that schools and districts kind of love to put on to, um, you know, the Internet. And so I guess I'd kind of like to maybe close um, this session in terms of your thoughts about, you know, what do you think about all the constraints that a lot of um, administrative teams put on access and, and how does that impede 
um, you know, many educators' willingness to embrace the internet, much less mobile devices. Well, there's actually an interesting um, statistic out there. Um, for many, many years, students would say their number one reason why they, um, their number one obstacle to using technology in their learning was the school filter. That the internet filter filtered out so many academically appropriate websites that it was just frustrating that they couldn't get into to a lot of the resources and really do the research that they want to do. Um, and, you know, I know we, you know, by, by law with CIPA we have to have filters and even the broad ones still, you know, filter out um, some really good and quality resources. You know, with my student teachers I always tell them go to the tech coordinator and ask them to open up sites. And usually if they ask, when I was a tech coordinator when teachers would come to me and say can you open up this site because I want to use it for X reason, I was more than happy to do that. Um, so I always really encourage my teachers to just be very proactive and to ask to open up sites that they want to use. If they want to try, um, I don't know, something that the YouTube or you know a polling site or a texting site to Selly and Selly's um, closed, then ask them to open it up. I know that doesn't really fix all the issues, but we do have to have filters for legal reasons. But at the same time, um, you know, I think most um, you know tech coordinators are 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 very open to opening up sites. They just have filters that filter things out rather than filter things in all the time. All right. Well, I want to be cognizant of everyone's time. I want to invite everybody and then joining me in a virtual round of applause for Dr. Kolb. Um, so a couple more things, you know, I, I want to invite you to continue the conversation um, on our hashtag mobile NCSU. I also um, want to um, thank um, the great um, host for this webinar, which is epica.org, um, which is another um, uh, project that I'm involved with that really helps schools and districts and teachers uh, work their way through um, the digital transition. Um, and so I want to highlight that this is an commu online community of practice and um, there are some great um, events coming up. Um, uh, just two days from now we have a great um, webinar with um, David Rose who is an expert in um, universal design for learning and Chris Beatty who hails from Harvard and is very forward thinking in terms of what digital technologies can do for education. Um, we also have a series where we look at some of these exact issues that all of you have been talking about, about not not every plan, not every idea will work with every school, every district. And, um, and so we invite different uh, districts from all across the nation to talk about their particular experiences in terms of going um, completely digital in their school or district. Um, I do something called Teacher Feature Friday, which is just uh, really a podcast, a video cast, uh, just really helping us all um, be, become highly connected educators. And then the, the theme in the beginning of the year will be looking for digital content. And then again, another one size doesn't fit all in December. Um, so definitely want to check out epiced.org. Um, and then finally, I'm going to put a um, link in the chat box and would invite you to please give your feedback to this webinar. I want to um, wholeheartedly thank all of you for coming. I know that you all are very busy doing many, many, many things in support of educating the most precious natural resource that this country has. So I want to applaud you and thank you for that. I want to thank um, Dr. Liz Kolb and her excellent work and for her to take time out to join us this evening. Thank you all very much. Please take time to fill out that evaluation and have a good night.